All right, we're right at our start time at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, so we're going to go ahead and begin. First off, good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Westbay from America Makes, and I'll be your host for today's TRX webinar. A few important notes before we kick off today's webinar. You should be seeing the TRX webinar screen. If not, please send me a note in the chat box, and I'll help you work through those issues. At the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A session. However, if you do have questions throughout the presentation today, feel free to type those into the Q&A space and we'll get to them through the presentation. If we don't get to them then, we will hold them for the session at the end of the presentation. Um, a little, back, little background on the TRX webinar series before I introduce our speaker. We developed this series to further support the America Makes role as a convener, coordinator, and catalyst for the additive manufacturing community. This has become a very easy, accessible platform that encourages knowledge sharing to take place among the additive manufacturing com community on a continual basis. In this series, we cover a wide array of topics presented by additive manufacturing experts, and today's title for the webinar is the 3D Printing War for Talent that's brought to us by Dr. Mike Vasquez of Three Degrees. Dr. Vasquez is a 3D printing expert specializing in pushing the boundaries of advanced 3D printing technology. He's the founder of Three Degrees, a Chicago-based consulting company focused on helping organizations maximize their investment in the technology. Over the past decade, he's worked side-by-side -side with some of the top manu machine manufacturers, material producers, and end users in the industry, consulting with them to identify novel applications to test new materials and develop framework to maximize R&D efficiency and boost ROI. In the past 18 months, Dr. Vasquez has worked with a dozen companies to help them set up successful and safe facilities. He's also created a software tool called Trace. It aims to assist companies familiarizing their use of 3D printing to ensure they can meet quality and technical standards outlined by their supply chain and industry requirements. He completed his PhD in additive manufacturing at Lowborough University and received both his bachelor's and master's from MIT in material science engineering. Today, Dr. Vasquez is going to share his perspective on the growing need to attract new talent with skills needed to capture opportunities created by additive manufacturing. Today's webinar will help you think through issues, including providing insights on what your company can do to make sure you're identifying and attracting the best talent to meet your business objectives. Dr. Vasquez will also share feedback from top students from over 30 different universities around the world, focusing on what they're looking for as they move from the classroom to the workplace. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Vasquez. Thanks, Tiffany, and thanks everyone for joining me this afternoon or morning or wherever you may be. I'm excited to talk through the 3D printing talent landscape and some of the insights that we've found over the last few months as we've kind of really scoured the ecosystem and talking to students around the world on kind of what companies are doing, what some of the best practices are, and where some of the gaps still remain in the war for 3D printing talent. So um, I'd like to just kind of start with a overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to leave plenty of quest time for questions um, throughout the day. And as well as Tiffany mentioned, I've got a dialog box open. So if you have specific questions as we go, um, feel free to enter those in and I'll be able to see them and potentially respond to them as we uh, move along in the conversation. So what we're going to do today is kind of go through a number of different kind of topics and um, provide some context on the insights that, that we've done over our, the research over the last few months. So um, first I'd like to give some background on and motivation for why we undertook this survey and research. I'll kind of go further into some of the key insights that were gleaned on um, how companies are attracting students, what are the best and uh, best practices and where some of the gaps still remain. Um, I'll kind of deliver some insights on what companies can do to improve um, as they go along in, in this process and especially as the technology continues to grow, kind of what they should be thinking about to both attract, uh, or both find, attract, and retain top talent in the additive manufacturing space. And then uh, with that, I'll wrap up with a few kind of best practice tips and, and we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, so I won't get into too much um, of background, Tiffany did a good job at that, but um, basically um, 
kind of my background is in additive manufacturing, kind of the material side, but I really got interested in the recruiting and kind of people development side early on and kind of in parallel to this um, as I was a research assistant for a book called Recruiter Die, How Any Company Can Beat the Big Guys in the War for Talent. So kind of in addition to the additive manufacturing spin and kind of where I focus much of my day, um, a lot of the insights and background um, and context for kind of building high quality organizations and scaling talent and, and things like that comes from experience in, in working on that book and interviewing um, at this point well over a thousand students from campuses around the world on how companies, not just in additive manufacturing, should be um, uh, kind of using their authenticity, their kind of leverage and, and skill sets and what they do best to attract um, employees that will both stay with them for a long time and deliver a lot of value. So kind of with that background and, and kind of with um, the added manufacturing space and, and kind of as it evolved, I thought it was an interesting topic to explore in more detail. So um, as Tiffany mentioned, um, I run a company called Three Degrees. We're based in Chicago. Um, we've worked with a number of organizations in the added manufacturing space, kind of both on um, kind of the small scale, small medium sized companies, but also larger companies that are moving towards production. So we've seen kind of the the evolution of the additive manufacturing workplace, and we continue to see how companies are adapting to this and and um, will kind of continue to do so in, in a way to both modernize their manufacturing as well as kind of provide value to their customers. So we're excited partners of America Lakes and, and thanks again to Tiffany and the team there for letting us talk today on, on the topic. So kind of getting into um, more the meat of, of what we're going to discuss today, um, I'd like to kind of share my general hypothesis on, on this. Um, so first, kind of 3D printing is a multifaceted technology. Um, it requires thoughtful strategy for both hiring and developing talent with skill sets that match the technology. So as many of you know who are using the technology or have kind of colleagues in your company to, that are leveraging it, um, it's not just a one skill set item. There are a number of things to consider um, on the engineering side, materials, mechanical, um, but a number of other kind of factors that come into play in terms of operating the machines, safety, kind of building the talent pipeline, educating people in the organization. So um, because of that, it can often be challenging to not only kind of build your team, but actually define what you need as a um, team itself to kind of build an organization that is effectively utilizing the, um, the tools. So um, first I want to give some kind of motivation and background on the survey. And, and before I do that, I really wanted to thank my colleague, Amro, who um, set spent a lot of time talking to students around the country, kind of putting out all the surveys and things like that. He did a great job in kind of compiling, compiling this as well. So um, kind of getting into this a little bit more um, kind of as a kind of 30,000 foot view of, of where we're at in the additive manufacturing space right now. Um, so as I mentioned, um, defining the roles in additive manufacturing is not straightforward. Um, depending on how your company is utilizing the technology, whether it's just starting with a prototype or going to full production, which will kind of be the, the real focus of today's conversation, you need a number of different people and kind of roles to satisfy the various steps in the process. So clearly the some of the obvious things you have your engineers whether it's mechanical materials aerospace or automotive or whoever it may be um, kind of often leveraging the technology or scouting the technology out for a company um, that's one of the most common things that that I've seen at least is um, in the space is that as you kind of start to uh, or as companies both big and small start to evaluate 3d printing and whether it works and is feasible for the business, typically the engineering or R&D staff will really take that on as um, as their primary or kind of um, their overall objective. So they'll be the one leading the charge to select equipment, select machines, do feasibility studies, things like that. And often kind of growing that out kind of beyond the R&D system can lead to some hiccups um, as more and more 
organizations or parts of the organizations are engaged. So we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, but in addition to that, um, as you know, kind of there's there's a need from a designing perspective or designers and how do you identify folks that have a, the knowledge set and skill set to design for additive. Um, as more and more companies go to production, there's this computer science or com and data science element um, that's required to um, kind of leverage some of the industry 4.0 where all the data that you're generating from from these these machines and tools and materials. Um, so kind of the uh, another piece of the the puzzle um, that comes into play. Um, additionally, you'll have technicians both operating the machines or operating support around the facility through post processing or or other pieces of that. Um, there may be a quality management inspection kind of part of the the organization, um, as well as some of the the other pieces of the business, um, kind of both the manager's business side who are communicating their um, the message of how we're using 3D printing to uh, to the outside world, um, as well as folks that are directly responsible for helping to recruit or hire or um, onboard new new people in the organization. So I think right now, I mean, as as we see it, we work with dozens of companies um, at any given time. I think it, it's rare outside of a handful of companies now to have kind of completely dedicated folks that 100% of their time is on spent on additive. But I think that is certainly changing as as larger companies take more investment in the comp in in these technologies. So the kind of the ecosystem in the last 5, 10, even 15 years where maybe one or two people kind of handled all of this information um, from the engineering to design to inspection, all of that was done through a couple people. I think really the, the trend we start to see, we're starting to see now and, and kind of one of the, the main motivations for the survey was that companies are, are trying to define roles and, and kind of put some silos or kind of um, off put some of the the responsibilities that may have been kind of combined into kind of one person in the um, in in the previous in a few years so um, kind of this context and, and this demand for additive manufacturing roles and jobs is um, certainly going to increase um, typically as you see if we take a step back of large technology trends like additive manufacturing and it, these things tend to move in one direction. It's consistently been growing over the last number of years, even a decade or so. Um, and I think the there's been several studies, one we'll, we'll cite here from A.T. Kearney, um, of just showing kind of the, the level of um, growth in some of these jobs that are supporting the additive manufacturing ecosystem from operations to engineering um, and just seeing kind of where some of the skill sets are continuing to grow and, and how you and this organization should kind of continue to think about this, that um, it's not going to be a kind of behind the scenes kind of only cutting edge types of companies using 3D printing. Um, you're going to start to have to compete with um, many different industries, not just aerospace or automotive, but sporting goods or whoever it may be, medical, um, to kind of get the type of talent that you're looking for. So. Um, in addition, we've got some of the kind of, um, I would say, stereotypical maxims that um, pose challenges from a recruiting and, and hiring challenge for manufacturing. Um, I think, um, not to single anyone out specifically, but I think GE was starting to try and get into looking at some of this with a few of their commercials. I don't know if anyone remembers those from a few years ago where they were trying to show how engineering is cool and interesting. Um, I think some of that mentality still remains is that um, are kind of these global trends that there is at least um, in certain geographies limited access to skilled workers. Um, the younger generation coming up um, tends to have a very narrow-minded view of what manufacturing might be. Um, not necessarily that if anyone's been in a 3D printing lab how it kind of can look like um, almost a clean room environment and 
and lasers and, and things and kind of all digital design is very kind of much futuristic. So I think the conceptions of what manufacturing and, and specifically what added manufacturing is also leads to some of these gaps in, in terms of students not considering the the field as a an area of study where kind of industries that may have kind of more sexy brand names around them like Amazon or Dropbox or Facebook or Google, whoever it be, like the general trend is, is kind of computer science, but I think there's still a lot of um, interesting work and interesting problems to be solved in, in materials and mechanical engineering um, specifically to that. Um, and I think the, the last piece, and, and we'll try and kind of get to this by the end of the, the time as well, is that um, companies don't necessarily have a complete AM strategy. Um, and I don't mean just a recruitment strategy. It's more of um, because it's so new um, and new in the sense of uh, thinking about production effectiveness and readiness, um, it, the use cases and the best practices and how companies actually think about this being delivered into their um, their business objectives and meeting their customer needs is, is not fully flushed out yet. And that, that'll take a number of years still for um, for companies to figure out. So in the meantime, what they've either been doing is taking a look at how can we either kind of leverage some of our existing energy engineering talent and kind of give them the task of um, selecting a new machine or investing in technology for feasibility um, to do that or hire someone in specific that has gotten some expertise there. So um, that's kind of, uh, that is certainly one segment of, of the population of, of, of companies looking to, to grow out their, their infrastructure that way. So kind of getting into kind of more of towards some of the data that we found and, and in order to, to really look at the space um, effectively, what we wanted to do was just understand more about what are universities um, and higher education organizations doing now to educate the their students on additive manufacturing, 3D printing in general. And we kind of found three different tiers of that. Um, I think the first um, being kind of limited, where um, most universities even um, at this point across the board have some maker equipment, things that small desktop FDM machines, things like that, um, available in a makerspace or access to a library or something nearby. So most universities have some sort of equipment like that. And even even so, um, as you go through an engineering course, um, most mechanical engineering, even um, design engineering as well, industrial engineering, do touch on 3D printing um, more from a prototyping perspective and they get a feel for that, but it's not really anything beyond kind of a cursory look. Um, you kind of get more of that into like these kind of what we term kind of the moderate kind of coverage of the technology um, where um, or where universities may offer a few semester long additive fo focus course. Um, they may have a couple of professors that as part of their research por portfolio are looking into um, added manufacturing research projects through America Makes or other organizations or um, NIH or NHS or whatever it may be. Um, and they may have on, on site some more expensive equipment. We termed it production equipment. That's kind of things that would cost maybe over 300K, um, some of the more production FDM or um, powder-based technologies. I think the last one um, is kind of so more self-explanatory where you have kind of the more extensive um, kind of coverage of the technology where universities offer specific degree programs or research programs specific to additive. Um, I did one of those going on 10 years ago at Loughborough University in the UK where there's a specific additive manufacturing research group. Um, others around the, the country or uh, both the US and globally are starting to um, kind of get more established um, where they have a number of professors doing research. There's a lab dedicated with two or three metals machines or polymer powder machines. Um, there's specific research with um, industry partnerships as well, both locally as well as um, kind, of, um, kind of higher level kind of cooperative agreements um, as well. So something to think about that kind of each of these um, 
kind of tiers is is where um, is where where the additive manufacturing space in, in universities is is currently and and I'll talk a little bit later on as like okay knowing this like how do we identify which of those universities should a uh, company with limited resources or, or things look for students that are interested in technology and interested in working on it in more detail. So um, there's another kind of facet that I don't want to underestimate here as well as the community college um, aspect. Um, so overall, a few of them have added manufacturing um, uh, resources or involvement with the technology, but that is changing uh, a number of um, community colleges are members of um, organizations like America Makes, and and they are part of kind of the growing push towards apprenticeship programs. And I know from a, a government perspective, there are some um, initiatives to to really help propel that forward for specific roles. So I think that is another kind of growing trend that um, that we've seen as as another potential pathway for kind of companies to to look at getting talent for specific roles. And all of this, I think, is also going to get flushed out in, in the next few years as well. So um, kind of that's the, the current mind or landscape for organizations that are in the um, or universities or kind of students that are coming up in universities. But um, I want to just briefly touch on, because this is a, a kind of a moving target, there are a number of um, courses for professionals, so people that have been in practicing engineer or designer or industrial engineer, whatever it may be, um, to get added um, insight and, and knowledge in the space. So um, and this includes online courses and on-site training. There's company-focused or company-developed training courses from some of the larger organizations, and um, but there's things from the University of Louisville and um, MIT and Penn State and others and SME and, and a number of these kind of um, courses that are being taught um, with different topics and different kind of levels of, of understanding. Most, for, th for the most part, um, they tend to focus on kind of a general high level approach of additive manufacturing. Some more go into specific topics like design or um, operation or facility safety. I think the the other thing to remember is in many cases, um, the OEMs and machine manufacturers are putting out some of their, their own courses as well. So, um, so that's another area. But um, kind of from that, that kind of gives a, a kind of a global view of the, um, the additive space of where we're at. We wanted to get into more detail of, of what we found in, in our surveys as we um, kind of present this data in, in more detail. So um, just to give you some context of, of what we were looking at, um, it was about a three-month survey. We had the um, survey open to a number of students. Um, I think there's opportunity to, to expand this a bit more to um, even get more insight, but um, we decided we um, had enough to, to at least share now, and I think this will continue to evolve. We um, talked to uh, students from about 30 different global universities. We had um, well over 60 kind of participants offer feedback, and the overall kind of survey took about 10 minutes. There was probably about 20, 25 questions, um, both um, kind of multiple choice or fill in the blank, but also kind of longer um, questions to gauge actual experience in the recruitment process of, of the additive manufacturing space. So. Um, can I give you a sense of who took the survey? Um, we talked to a number of um, kind of students from all different kind of levels of their in their or, um, education career, um, most of which were kind of college seniors um, that were just about to get into this um, uh, their professional lives. So this is an insightful group because they had gone through a couple of years where they could have gotten. Um, internships, um, and we're just kind of going through the the recruitment process of of um, for their next stage in in their life. Um, but we also talked to folks that were in graduate school, so we reached out to, to some of the, the different degree programs and mechanical engineering and things like that um, as well. So um, I think kind of getting into some of the details that we wanted to share here is that. Um, the familiarity with 3D printing um, is beginning earlier. Um, 
I think even most kind of respondents said they had at least heard of the technology before um, before getting to college. Um, however, we'll caveat that with the fact that in most cases, the understanding of the technology um, and what 3D printing was centered more around things like kind of desktop um, maker style printers. Um, so they were while familiar with the technology and had a general understanding and appreciation of what it did, I think the the key thing and kind of going back to how universities are teaching it in these different tiers is it's very much kind of a, a cursory level until you actually get experience and get um, an understanding and familiarity of how the uh, technology works at the production level. Um, most students don't have that kind of understanding and I think that's a gap that that we'll we'll touch on in, in a way that um, many companies can can use as a, a way to attract and um, kind of better educate their potential um, student pipeline with some of these interesting kind of case studies and use cases that are going on with more sophisticated technology. Um, so the next thing that we kind of recognized is that um, the, Students do recognize that the additive manufacturing industry is, sorry, they, they recognize that it's a kind of separate industry um, and also considered a viable path for a career. So I thought this was extremely interesting and enlightening. Having been kind of in kind of my own personal experience, having been in the, the technology space for um, over a decade now and kind of seeing it being kind of a nascent technology and kind of in somewhat the shadows and not super publicized. I think it's exciting to know that um, students coming out of university now at least have explored the space as a profession. So I think that's that's extremely exciting and I think it's exciting to you who are um, looking to better understand your potential pipeline or build your team. I think um, the sales job is um, a little bit easier given that it's it's not um, kind of one of these things where you really have to convince people that it's a viable space um, at this point. Um, secondly, I think um, it was really interesting to see we asked students kind of what are the as you consider at the manufacturing versus uh, other options that you may be considering in your career path like what are the top three reasons that you the AM space might appeal to you. So um, kind of ranked in order, that was the first one was the work, essentially kind of the actual hands-on or kind of actual research or production work that, that folks might be doing. I think secondly, people really thought there was an opportunity for advancement in the space, not only from a kind of their own personal career, but I think this is also teamed up with the fact that the technology is continuing to evolve and fe feeling like you're on kind of this wave of new technology and kind of new manufacturing was something that certainly permeated the feelings of, of many of the students that we talked to. Um, third, and I think this will probably come up with whatever you might um, ask people in, in terms of kind of why they might select a job, but it was kind of the money as well. So I think while um, uh, it's probably worth doing kind of in, in the future. We did ask some salary expectations of, uh, of what students might expect coming out of university and going into a job with um, for additive. Um, it was essentially in line with what most um, kind of uh, mechanical engineering or materials engineering kind of um, new employees would, would see kind of an, on average across the U.S. So, um, that's something that that is interesting. Um, I think going back to some of the stuff we talked about earlier with the different roles, I think that might there's probably some room for study on on how that might kind of stratify it depending on the role. Um, so kind of a key takeaway I think for from this for for you as you're listening to this and saying, hey, how can I use some of this information to help what we're doing? I think the the first thing is. Um, being able to develop a unique value proposition that is attractive to your organization and what you do. Um, so I think this requires some work and some alignment between um, what you're do 
what you're doing, what you're planning to do, and who is involved. But I think spending some time on what is the value proposition that you as a medical device manufacturer, an aerospace manufacturer, or a materials company have to offer a, a student coming into your organization. So it could be things like having access to cutting edge technology or being able to um, publish some of the work or join consortiums as part of the company to publicize the work that they're doing, things like that, and understanding kind of how that fits into a greater business model where we're saying if we're in the medical space, we're de developing uh, new manufacturing to help better patients' lives or things like that. So I think tying your kind of value proposition, some call it mission statement, to specific tangible things will really help clarify and communicate effectively what you're doing with um, with your workforce and how you develop it specific to additive. Um, kind of some more insights that, that we found and, and that we found interesting was that um, students are finding out about specific opportunities in a number of different ways. So kind of on the left here, kind of in order of, of popularity, um, a lot of it came through web searching. Um, second, kind of in the, the next tier was through sometimes career fairs or where you talk to engineers specifically. I'm not a huge fan of career fairs. Um, I'll kind of digress for a second in terms of um, thinking through this from a, a company perspective. Um, mainly, I think the the reason, especially for uh, an organization that is looking at um, kind of recruiting specifically for added manufacturing, I just think there's a lot better ways to spend your resources um, than sending uh, two or five or ten people to a career fair and having them sit and wait for people to come to you passively throughout the day. Um, I think. Um, doing a more targeted approach and I'll talk more about how we actually kind of do some different things besides career fairs um, can really help what what you're doing um, and maybe make it more effective for finding the right person that you're looking for. Um, professors are a big connection point. Um, I would encourage you if uh, your members of America Makes or other consortiums to utilize the professor network that is or academic network that often comes with these um, fairs has, um, or events or whatever it may be to um, find out who their students are that are up and coming or looking for jobs and may not be on the professor track or whatever it may be. I think that's a really great opportunity and, and a place where you can mine um, talent very effectively uh, from a trusted source and someone that may be doing work related to what your research is or what your production methods are on, on your campus or on your site. Um, the other thing that um, is kind of insightful from how people are considering kind of working in the ads and manufacturing space is um, kind of what are the metrics or what are the things that they value in terms of looking for a 3D job opportunity, 3D printing job opportunity. Um, the first one and the top one kind of aligns with kind of that previous slide of it's really about the work. Um, it's the type of project that we'll be working on. So is it, are they going to be um, kind of in a leadership role or are they going to be able to be mentored or is it a project that works on some cool lattice design? So kind of being able to really specific, in specific terms, talk about the work and talk about how cool it is, is, is really something that is an effective recruiting technique that um, can go a long way to selling your message on on site um, or on campus with with students. Um, the second piece I think is is also important um, is showing people or telling people what is the opportunity for advancement and what does the future look like. Are you going to be getting more machines in? Are you looking to expand to different business segments? Um, and and what does that look like? And so being able to either point to um, and bring in um, current employees that have gone, started from a new hire and talking about their career trajectory is always helpful. I think um, adding specifics in this case to um, to say specific to added manufacturing is, is also useful. 
Um, so I think one of the things that is is kind of challenging and some of the nuance in this is that um, in many cases, as I mentioned, most companies are still trying tip to trying to tiptoe around what what does 3D printing mean for our organization and how are we um, adjusting to um, using its capabilities and assessing its feasibility. So um, pointing out, hey, if 3D printing, like our plan for 3D printing is is X, Y, and Z, but um, kind of being honest and being authentic with with folks to say that if if that all kind of blows up or or doesn't go anywhere, there are other opportunities or or ways to advance your career. I think one of the things we've um, I've learned is, is kind of talking to a number of students uh, around the country and uh, about recruiting and 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 talking about how they think about their career. Um, it's not one of those things where um, people anticipate being in the same job for 20, 30 years. I think people are excited about um, different opportunities, um, trying to make sure that their career path is the best for them, not necessarily for the company. So it's kind of a shift in mindset from um, <clears throat> what it may have been 10, 20 years ago. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. Um, so kind of one thing to uh, kind of take away from, from this slide and some of this insight was that in order to make your kind of previous slide, we had kind of develop your value proposition. The next piece that we want to kind of add on to that is you need to design a set of processes for university recruiting to make your company as attractive and competitive as possible, but not waste money on conventional conventional or inefficient recruiting techniques. So knowing kind of how to reach uh, uh, the students, what clubs to engage, what professors, um, what time of year even to kind of reach students is really important to, to understand and kind of maximize your, your resources when it comes to the technology. So um, the next piece that I wanted to, to really kind of hone in on as well is that we got a lot of insight um, from specifically asking question, uh, students to kind of write out some of their experiences when it comes to um, good, bad, and ugly uh, recruiting uh, stories or um, examples that they've gone through as they've been talking to companies both about additive manufacturing as well as um, kind of more general and how to, engineering or kind of other other career paths. So um, things that I think are were the ones that stood out for me is that um, students want to hear about real world examples. Um, and I think the specifics of, uh, of this um, is that they see, they've seen kind of the maker level um, systems for a long time now. How can you show them that it's not just a toy and how that how are companies using this effectively in, in kind of the next generation of um, aircraft or cars or whatever it may be. Um, the second kind of quote that I think stood out as well was that um, projects and companies should be aware of how well the their technical experience matches matches um, what their goals are. So I think that gets into some of this underlying fear both from, that goes both ways, not only from a student's perspective of like, am I getting the right education to go work for a automotive company, additive manufacturing lab or um, something like that. So I think there is this kind of fear and under, um, I guess more lack of clarity when it comes to um, if a, a company is looking for an additive manufacturing engineer or technician or whatever it may be, um, often I've looked at a number of these um, uh, job descriptions and, and job postings online and um, the person that if they had every one of those items that was listed on there really doesn't exist. And especially and that can be intimidating for um, students coming right out of university where you'd need um, uh, be able to have a concentration in material science and ability to CAD effectively and do FEA and understand metallurgy and things like that. So I think being honest with 
both on your job description and what roles are you searching for and um, being flexible of what what is a, a non-starter or having like something like you need to have some materials expertise but you don't have to have a PhD or whatever it may be and where what part of development of the talent is going to come internal and what is kind of expected and upfront is is really important and kind of the last um, piece that I wanted to kind of highlight was that um, I think many companies are making the mistake of going the other way where they're going too general in uh, trying to attra attract talent um, for specific additive manufacturing um, experience. So I think what we've seen a lot, uh, or at least I've seen a lot on job descriptions uh, are that people are looking for a general mechanical engineer or technician or whatever it would be, and one line or one bullet point on the job description will be about additive manufacturing um, and not really go into detail. So uh, this often gets um, confused of what is is confusing for the students and, and uh, likely for the recruiters or having to explain what the roles it are to understand what what is it that they're looking for when it comes to a specific skill set and a specific requirements to be successful in the job. So something, these are kind of direct from students and I think from their experience and we read a lot of these and um, a lot of them align to, to these types of, of experiences as well. So I think just something to take away and um, anytime you can, can talk with students and I think it's a, is a really effective way to to manage how how you're doing on campus. So um, another really kind of key point um, that I I was excited to see um, from running a small company is that um, uh, small and medium sized companies are actually very um, uh, appealing to new graduates. I think it was it was something that was um, a little bit uh, surprising to me. Um, especially given the context of manufacturing and um, where a lot of the big um, storylines come from in um, in the added manufacturing space um, uh, in the public eye and things like that. So um, almost over 50% of um, students, if they were given the choice of kind of starting their career at a large company or a startup or a small company, routinely kind of chose the established small company as their um, top choice. So I think um, this is great if you're a small, medium-sized company, even a startup to an extent. I think there are advantages to um, kind of selling that story because you kind of get the the default uh, um, kind of preferences. But um, but at the same time, if you are a large company, um, I would the, the way I kind of position this or or talk about this in, in the context of recruiting is that um, the reality is in most organizations, 3D printing is still kind of viewed as a um, fledgling or small business um, that is looking to, to grow in an organization. I mean, even if you look at the general stats of how big of a percentage added manufacturing is compared to the whole manufacturing ecosystem, it's, it's tiny, it's peanuts. Um, so I think talking about how um, we're, how this could be a business within a company that's on a growth trajectory, small teams, and and things like that. Because I think at the if you peel back the um, the orange a little bit on why are these kind of students kind of thinking about this and and the way that they are, I think it's a combination of um, one having the ability to have some stability with kind of an established name or or company, but at the same time having that face time or ability to be mentorship or the ability to get on a growth trajectory or a mentorship trajectory where you're expanding your career path is is something that is appealing and, and can be leveraged in, in any one of these these options. So I don't think there's, um, if you're a established big company, I don't think it's the state of point is, is one thing to, to, to mark a specific trend, but a or specific um, data point, but I don't think it's um, necessarily a, a negative to um, to be in that position. If anything, it's probably a positive because there's a lot of a lot of different ways to spin this and um, in different areas. So, um, kind of as we get towards the the back quarter of the hour here, I wanted to um, 
make sure I leave some some time for questions. So, uh, but at the same time, I want to make sure that um, leave you with some kind of specifics on how do you develop a AM talent strategy. Um, so I think the the first thing, is, and and really this this comes back to one thing that I'm really um, um, kind of harp on over and over and have repeated several times is that in order to find good talent, it's important to be honest about where the technology is in your organization um, and be authentic about that. And I'll keep saying that word authentic because I think that people see through that and people understand that um, um, and it goes a long way. So the first one is define your goals both in terms of kind of today and, and what is the the trajectory of the technology with the company and what sort of team do you need to do that. Um, it's good and almost necessary to make sure that you're identifying and properly labeling your different roles and responsibilities, um, both in current terms of kind of a static, um, what is it today, but um, as we get more people, what do we want them to do? Where are we going to find them or what are, how will our needs change? I think it's, it's very important to at least map out and, and it's not a um, two plus two equals for a type of equation. These things change, and as you think about talent, it, it, it continually changes. But in uh, having the conversation and make sure you're thinking about it is is something that is, is necessary. Um, and then at the same time, it's important to make sure that uh, you map out what are the trajectories of people that come in as new hires, and what will they be doing in two, three, four years, and, and how is that going to change? Um, are you going to have rotation programs or um, will they be a manager of a specific product line or specific technology or what does that look like and, and how do you make sure that you can validate that as, as you go along? And I think hand in hand with that, as you start to kind of build your own kind of story and reputation in um, uh, inside of your organization, kind of how you convey that onto campus um, is extremely important and at the same time doesn't require a huge investment. So um, I think things you can do today inside your organization without a lot of investment um, is make sure that you're up to date with the schools that are using the technology that you're interested in. Um, look at the consortiums that are out there, look at um, who's publishing the research papers in specific areas that you're 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 looking at um, kind of putting down that list. Um, the second is making sure that you identify schools and programs and departments or professors that are leaders in the industry. Um, at this point, it's still fairly small, so look who's presenting at conferences, look who's going to IMTS or MMX or whoever, um, whatever um, form next and things like that that um, might be building a pipeline of, of talent and interesting research. Um, and then the third piece is like make sure you mine your internal networks and um, identify potential links to these target schools, whether they're alumni or kind of uh, maybe your CEO or CTO or maybe maybe doing a, a talk at one of these schools and how do you get your name in or your part of the organization in that in that conversation. So um, the other piece of that is kind of once you're on campus, what do you need to be aware of? Um, first, it's you make you need to make sure that you know the campus and know the school calendar. When are students going to be looking for jobs? When are they most receptive? Like when are finals? When are midterms? When are big engineering competitions? And knowing things like that so that you're um, kind of constantly both in the mix, but not at a point in time where you're not getting anyone to come to a um, information session or webinar or something like that. Um, I think it's also important to make sure that you do your homework on what are the key student clubs and support activities. Many schools offer co-op programs at this uh, these days where you can have an intern for half a year or a full year and, and work with them and kind of build a relationship with the students that you want to hire. So I think that's something to, to really explore and I advocate those, um, especially with universities that are focused in on, on additive and have technology to, to do that. Um, so kind of leaving off on the last three things to, to kind of really remember is um, kind of the before I kind of leave it open for questions is that um, I think 
The first one is make sure you focus on your communication, interview, and recruiting process. I can't emphasize this enough um, because as we ask people, um, one of the nightmares, uh, one of the questions we asked of what, what them was like, what are your nightmare recruiting stories? And without fail, we had un everybody was, uh, most everybody was able to give some sort of example. And I think the, the key thing to remember here is that bad news travels much faster than good news. Um, and many people are willing to talk about their bad experience in the recruiting or process. And oftentimes it, it really hinges on poor communication and not being communicative about what the process is, um, what's the timeline, who are they looking for, how is it gonna kind of play out, who am I gonna talk to? And I think th these are simple things, or simple things if done effectively, and, and making sure that everyone's on the same page of describing what the roles are and, and how you're gonna talk to people and that you're not overlapping and things like that. So I think investing time in, in your processes it can be something that is, is highly beneficial. The next one um, it kind of goes hand in hand with that is um, I think in order to sell your company, you have to be authentic and show actually delivering on what you're selling. So um, this often is harder than it looks, um, but it can be um, something that is critical. So if you say you have a um, highly collaborative um, ecosystem that people are sharing information and ideas between departments, things like that, make sure that that's actually happening and show people how that's being done. Um, same thing on um, kind of building a culture that promotes people and kind of um, through not only internal networks but, but external as well. So I think that's kind of, if anything, I think making sure that um, you're, you're doing this and communicating it effectively is, is kind of the first step. And, and you don't have to be um, kind of all things to everyone. I think, as I keep saying over and over, it's like know what you do and tell people what you do and, and be good at what you do. I think that's really kind of the, the main message I wanna get across is that um, understand how your organization works. One of the good things, be honest about what the, um, maybe some of the negatives might be, but um, kind of tell people how they've worked within that organization over time. Um, and then finally, kind of the last one as I've been harping on over and over again is make sure that you're authentic to your organization, your people, and those who are you're trying to find, attract, and, and retain. So I think that's kind of the, the key thing here. So um, just to put kind of money where our, my mouth is in terms of what we're doing on as part of our company to, to help build our talent pipeline, um, I think a number of things, but um, the the first one is we've spent a lot of time connecting the universities and through consortiums and America Makes and the MDII and others to identify kind of the universe, the professors and things like that that are um, kind of leading the way, and and we found a number of students and interns through um, through that that pipeline. Um, we've also given talks and done guest lectures and, and things that, that sponsored research at, at universities as well to, to help build that pipeline as well. Um, internally, we've also built some software tools to help our teams communicate effectively throughout the additive manufacturing process, a tool called Trace that allows kind of workflow to kind of um, to communicate from the designer to the um, technician running the machine to the engineers doing the materials development, all of that information is, is kind of stored and, um, and provided. And uh, the next thing we're actually doing is a, a training workshop for kind of HR and talent team specific to additive manufacturing. So something we're doing in the future and if anyone's interested, they can email me about that as well. So um, with that, I'll leave a few minutes for questions and we're getting to the top of the hour here. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to um, to chat today and um, excited to um, keep in touch if, if you have any further questions. So thank you. Thanks, Dr. Vasquez. This is such a hot topic. I'm so glad that you're able to spend some time with us today and share your insights with us. It was definitely an invaluable session. Um, with that, we do want to open it up to Q&A. So those on the line, if you do have some questions, please feel free to put those inside the Q&A um, section there on your screen. 
while we're waiting for some of those questions to come through, I do have a couple here. So the first one, um, you, you mentioned, you know, the results of your survey came from a variety of different universities. Do you have a preference in which schools employers should be looking at to hire AM talent? Yes, I mean, there are a number of kind of ones that come off the top of my head. I mean, it's <clears throat> places like Penn State, um, University of Louisville, um, you can kind of go down the list of, of um, I keep going back to the America Makes kind of partner website, but that's a great place to start <laughs> in terms of, of finding a lot of um, at least a first starting point of, of where there's activity going on at a level that of that you might think of production or, or highly technical. So I think that's a great place to start, but those are a few places that are, are really doing it. In the UK, there's um, Nottingham, Sheffield, Loughborough, kind of in the, in the Midlands and a number of others that are doing it as well. So I think um, it's, uh, it, it's growing, but I think if you are smart about where you look, it's, it's doable to find kind of those, those hotbeds. So kind of building off of that question, when you're looking at, you know, hiring a new person versus training somebody in-house, how do you balance that? And is there pros and cons associated with each different option? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that I get that a lot. Um, I think um, one of the big, I think, advantages of hiring um, outside of your organization, especially um, from the new hire perspective, is I mentioned that stat of like, that most students have been familiar with added manufacturing even before they got to university. So you think they've been at least familiar with design for additive manufacturing since they were in high school. So I think understanding the, or one of the biggest gaps I, I see over and over again in just the, the overall adoption of the technology is making sure that you understand how the design rules are different than injection molding or machining. Um, so I think one of the advantages there of, of hiring someone new that's been familiar at least conceptually with design for added manufacturing is can be a real advantage versus kind of unteaching or kind of adding to someone's understanding of how to design for injection molding. So that's one kind of advantage I would say there. But overall, I think it, it really depends on the organization. And, and I think more and more there are some courses to help with educating kind of existing engineers, but oftentimes it, it can be expensive and, and take a, a number of, um, uh, uh, of courses or specific trainings to do so. Great. Well, and because this industry is so rapidly changing and each company is going to have their own specific set of requirements, do you have any advice or recommendations for an employer that is getting ready to open up a job requisition and what kind of job description they should um, put out to be able to, to ensure they're attracting the right talent? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that has to, I mean, the first one is being authentic to kind of what it is that they're doing and having a good understanding of what it is specifically they need. But I think with um, some investment early on in, in terms of either geography or location or specific programs, I think you can get very quickly through um, kind of a good kind of set of 10 to 20 candidates. And, and it doesn't hurt just to, to have informal sessions where you start to talk to people to get a sense of what you may be looking for. I think that's something I've done um, over time with some of my job descriptions is understand how, um, like just by talking to people, you start to understand what aren't you communicating effectively or what's not clear. I think just being on the, um, just expecting a, the first job description to kind of find that perfect person is, is often a, a losing battle. I think you have to do your homework, do your investment, and spend some time on campus or wherever it may be to, to really kind of get that perfect person. Yeah. Yeah, and then it might be helpful too to, um, you know, where are they posting the job descriptions at, you know, using those resources that you mentioned earlier on as platforms to advertise for openings also. Yep. All right, well, well, that concludes the questions that I have here. Um, we'll give it another second or two for anybody on the line to submit I some see, more. Uh, uh, Francesco has one, so it says, um, how would you help companies enlarge the audience of their job offers, and how would you make candidates connect to them? Um, so I think um, 
I guess the the first thing I, I mean, having a lot, there's kind of two approaches here, like casting a wide net so you capture a lot of different people and um, and trying to find the uh, sort through the canons out of that. I think I'm kind of more of the approaches. I want to make sure that um, kind of the people I am talking to are high quality, so that I'm not kind of spending a lot of time on the um, candidates that may be kind of outside of the scope of, of what my job description is. So I end up kind of doing a little bit of the reverse and not necessarily casting a wide net and um, talking to professors first and um, or talking to specific groups or departments. I do that first usually and find out like, hey, who's who are your rock stars? Who are the people that are really interested in technology? And then kind of go um, talk to them and, and understand what they're doing. And I think one thing to remember too, as well, is that um, I think this goes to enlarging your um, your reach is that once you get on a campus, I think if you provide a good experience, whether it's an internship program or alumni or something like that, kind of word spreads and like you can kind of build a reputation on, on campus so that the, next, the first year you may have one or two people that you specifically target and then if they work out great at your internship, then the next year you have kind of an advocate on uh, on campus that you can use to say, hey, who is the best person to get and, and kind of that builds from there. So I think focusing in on um, if you do that kind of specific targeting of finding a professor, or finding a, a, a research group or university and start to build a pipeline over time, I think you can really enlarge your, your potential um, kind of candidate net. Hey, great, thank you. Well, that brings us back up to the top of the hour. So unless you see some more questions coming through on your end, I think now's a good time to end. No, I think that's it. Okay. Well, I do want to thank you one more time um, for presenting and folks on the line, I want to thank you for participating with us today. Um, if anybody on the line is interested in hosting one of these webinars in the future, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, Dr. Vasquez's contact information is available, so feel free to reach out to him directly for, with any follow-up questions. And with that, I, we will end. Thank you. Thanks.